Hey there, welcome to Autumn Afar, and welcome back to those of you who've joined me before. As always, any of the links that I've used as part of this video are going to be down in the description box below, and I encourage you to do your own research and form your own opinions. Today's video is my favorite experiences from around the world. Not all of them will be incredible and life-changing, but they do mean a lot to me in some way, shape, or form. And I do hope you find at least one that you would like to experience yourself. This won't be specific places, rather it will be things, but you'll see what I mean in a minute. So there are so many incredible things that you can do when you travel and not everybody wants to do the same things. Personally, I'm someone who really enjoys history and culture and architecture and hiking, but I know a lot of people who just want to sit on a beach and hang out, relax, take in the sun, go for a swim. But when I plan a trip, I like to look into what activities I can do, and in no particular order, these are a few of the things that I look for every time I'm planning a trip. So the first one on the list today is going to be theme parks. Disney, Universal, and Six Flags are among many recognizable theme park names that appear around the world and have absolutely massive parks filled with rides and adrenaline. Growing up, the theme park that I always went to is called La Ronde. It's a Six Flags park just off the island of Montreal. And I absolutely loved it as a kid. The rides were fast, the, sh the, the lines were pretty short, generally speaking. But as I got older, I kind of realized that it doesn't measure up to other parks. La Ronde specifically doesn't have a lot of shade. The food is really overpriced and they don't have a lot of options. And when I was 12, I took my first trip on a plane and we went to Florida where I got to go to Disney and Universal parks as well as SeaWorld. While I loved Disney and Universal, I kind of complained a lot of the time about SeaWorld and how guilty it made me feel being there and seeing these poor animals locked up in cages, but that's another video completely. Disney and Universal specifically changed how I saw theme parks. They were well run, they were well designed, they had a lot of options, and they had trees and shade all over the place, which was something I wasn't used to. I also saw the wide variety of rides that they had, and honestly getting to meet all kinds of different characters from my childhood was definitely an added bonus, and that was I was still young enough to appreciate that, and I actually still have the autograph book somewhere from that trip, and it's something that I'm definitely going to hold on to despite the fact that I could probably get another one, but it's still pretty special. I would definitely go back to the parks, but I doubt it would be as special as it was when I was 12. I've heard of a lot of adults going Disney bounding, which sounds like a lot of fun. It's where you dress up almost like a character in the same color schemes or wearing similar fabrics, but not actually dressing up as a character since you're not allowed to do that at Disney as an adult. I would highly recommend if you go bringing a water bottle because these parks are absolutely massive and honestly you'll probably end up needing it because you'll rack up a lot of steps and specifically in Florida it's really hot and so it's always a good idea to stay hydrated. So the next item is hiking. I started hiking when I was a little kid. I started around maybe six or seven and it's something that stayed with me even now. I feel like that might be one of the reasons I wanted to travel to New Zealand so much is because they have some incredible hikes and nature walks. Another place that had fantastic hikes and nature walks was Australia. Tasmania specifically when I was there had some really incredible hikes that I really wasn't expecting but it was absolutely stunning. Um, Dove Lake was one of my favorites as well as Uluru which I talked about in another video. It didn't seem like it would be long but it lasted hours. So I would really highly recommend checking out the different hiking options. I've also heard great things about Blue Mountains in Sydney that I didn't get to visit, but I would really love to go there if I get back to Australia. And if you've seen my last video, you know that I really love the walk around Lake Matheson and uh, the hike to Franz Joseph Glacier was another favorite of mine from that trip. Hikes don't only need to be far out in the forest in nature. You can also take urban hikes. One of my favorite things to do when I get to a new city is to drop my stuff off at my accommodation and just go for a walk. Grab my phone, pair of headphones, and just walk around aimlessly. I generally try and keep track of where I've gone and I always have a GPS and always try and check and make sure I'm able to find some kind of internet connection if I don't have data, 
and I just walk around. I'm someone who has a pretty good internal compass, so I'm never worried about getting lost. And even if I do, I'm pretty easily able to find my way back, generally speaking, especially if I'm in a city. So I'm very familiar with how cities are usually laid out. It's a really great way to get to know a place and you never really know what you're gonna stumble across. When I went to Sydney and took my urban hike, I ended up finding a store that was uh, doing a moving sale and I got two full sets of bathing suits for like $45, which usually would have been over 200. So it really works out a lot of the time, especially if you're hiking or walking around in a densely populated downtown area. If you're looking for a place that generally has free Wi-Fi, if you can find a Sephora or a McDonald's or a Burger King, Subway sometimes has free Wi-Fi as well. And most people, if you go into a shop or a restaurant, are willing to give directions or help you out if you end up getting lost. I've seen so many beautiful places that I wouldn't have otherwise seen if I hadn't been taking urban hikes. So I really do recommend it. Even if you just try it in your own city, you'd be surprised what you end up finding. Another really great example is when I was walking around in Auckland on my second, my first or second day there, I ended up coming across a museum that I didn't end up knowing about and I got in for free and I got to walk around the museum in air conditioning and have Wi-Fi for a good two or three hours and it was a really great introduction not just to Auckland but to New Zealand in general because museums generally speaking have some really great artifacts from the country and from the culture that they're in as well as pieces from around the world. Speaking of museums, cultural experiences are another really great thing to look forward to whenever you go somewhere new. As I was saying on my first day in Auckland, I was kind of walking around and stumbled across this museum and went in and spent hours looking around at local and international art. And it was also the first time I had seen Maori art in person in its in its home country and it's an experience I'll never forget. I was also fortunate enough a couple days later to visit the Waitangi Treaty Grounds in the North Island of New Zealand near the Bay of Islands where I learned about the history of the Maori people and the Treaty of Waitangi in the absolutely stunning setting of the Bay of Islands. It was an incredible place to learn about the history not only of the land but of the treaty from people who understand it and have such a close connection to it and to learn from the people who signed it and who have been affected by it since it came into effect. Another great museum in uh, New Zealand was the Te Papa Museum in Wellington which has exhibits about wildlife and aspects of life in New Zealand like their contribution to war efforts during World War II which many people don't know about specifically in North America because generally speaking we only talk about Britain and the United States and sometimes Canada and we don't usually talk about everybody else but a lot of other people made sacrifices and had losses and they definitely deserve to be recognized for that. Continuing on with museums, the museum in Melbourne um, I believe it was a museum of history and natural history. It's absolutely fantastic. It's beautifully curated and they've even got some wildlife in there. There's also the, you know, the reigning superpower of museums like the Louvre. I really didn't like Paris that much, but the Louvre was easily one of my favorite parts of my time in Paris. The architecture, the history, the sculptures, the location is just absolutely fantastic and it's easily one of the most beautiful places I've ever visited and it's so wonderfully curated. I also really love their Instagram page so if you're looking for a little bit of art in your life definitely go follow the Louvre on Instagram. As someone who isn't religious I've also really enjoyed time at different religious sites like the Vatican and Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris before the fire as well as various places in Austria and Germany that were really unexpected and I didn't expect to find, but they were absolutely stunning and they were really special places. Especially considering how old they are, it was really special for me to be able to visit a, a structure that's older than my country. It's really, really impressive in a lot of different ways. It's something I wasn't expecting to enjoy as much as I did, but I'm really impressed by it. Speaking of unexpected, sometimes the most surprising part of a trip is food. I am personally a really, really picky eater. I don't eat most seafood. I don't really eat a ton of vegetables. I absolutely hate lettuce. 
So I often eat the same variations of food no matter where I go with a couple of exceptions, additions of new spices or toppings, but it's usually pretty much the same stuff. Every so often I am shocked by something I eat or something I drink. When I was in Europe, I got to eat a lot of different foods. Unfortunately, because I was on a school trip, despite being legally allowed to have alcohol, I wasn't able to have any beer or wine when I was in Germany or in Italy, so I stuck to the food. Italy, as expected, was incredible. The pasta, the pizza, the gelato. I miss gelato. And no one is gonna be surprised by that. Italy is so incredibly well known for their food and their food culture. One thing that didn't really surprise me was how good the food was in Germany. The first thing I think of Germany is never the food, but the food in Germany was fantastic. When we went to Munich, we had this incredible chicken at a brew house. So we went right outside the city center because it's less expensive. If you're gonna pay 10 or $15 less, it's worth the time to go slightly outside the city and pay less for your meal and see a different portion of the city that you might not have otherwise seen. And they had really great pretzels with it. Oh my God, it was so good. Um, Sorry, I'm just thinking of pretzels now. At the central train station, I also had some really great fries, uh, which I was not expecting. I really enjoyed them, but I'm still very confused with the fact that they put the ketchup over top. And by the time I got to the bottom, there was no ketchup left for the bottom fries. It was very sad. I also couldn't not talk about my favorite ever wine, my only favorite wine um, that I tasted at St. Clair's Vineyards in the Marlboro region of New Zealand. It was a dessert wine and it was the best wine I've ever had in my life. Sadly, we don't have it here from what I've found, which is really, really unfortunate because I would definitely buy it, but I'm also not ready to buy it by the case because that gets really expensive as far as shipping goes. There was also this one specific cider that I found that I liked by Thomas and Rose. It was watermelon and cucumber flavored. And it was absolutely delicious. Everybody comes for me and they say that that sounds really gross, but I promise you, it was really good. It was really, really, really good. I adored it. My biggest regret is that I wasn't drinking it from the beginning of the trip because I saw it and I said, hmm, that sounds interesting. But I went for this cheap $5 bottle of wine, which I didn't end up drinking. That's a whole other story. Despite this, I'm not much of a drinker, mostly because I don't like most of these alcohols. After I left New Zealand, I didn't drink much as well because I wanted to make sure that my mind was clear for when I went diving when I got to Australia, so it was a couple weeks difference, but I wanted to make sure that there were no issues with the dive because I've been waiting probably, my, I waited basically my whole life to go and dive at the Great Barrier Reef and it was an absolutely incredible experience. Speaking of diving, diving and snorkeling is the next item on this list. I've been a certified scuba diver since I was 16. I took a course over the summer and I got my certification. As much as I hated the classes, math in the summer. Seriously, no one wants to do math in the summer. I absolutely love diving. There have been a couple times, unfortunately, where I got sick and wasn't able to go diving because if you can't equalize, you could possibly rupture your eardrum and that means you can't dive. When I have been able to dive, a couple times I've been able to go, the Great Barrier Reef was by far my favorite. I talked about this a little bit uh, in another video but I had an external hard drive and literally the day after I got home, it crashed and I lost almost all of my photos and all of the videos that I took, including my videos of the Great Barrier Reef dive that I took and it really, really sucks. Um, but I still have the memory of seeing this clownfish with a little baby clownfish swimming behind him and it was really cute. And all the other incredible creatures in the environment without having a screen in front of me and it's something I really really hope to do again because I really love that experience. All the times I wanted to dive but couldn't, I ended up snorkeling and it's just as fun. When I was in Cayo Santa Maria in Cuba, there the resort that we were staying at had this really big rock that blocked like in between the two beaches that they had so you had to take a little you had to take like this golf cart in between them and you could, if you were careful enough, you could swim near the rock and there were all kinds of fish and there were starfish and there were sand dollars. There were all kinds of different creatures that you could see and you could interact with. And in Grand Cayman, it's really fantastic because even though I wasn't able to dive after I ended up getting sick just before we went, uh, you're still able to see in the water and you're still able to you know, feed the fish and see all kinds of wildlife and creatures, which is a lot of fun. So there's a couple other things that 
are kind of things I've already talked about. I love seeing things that you can only see in a couple of different locations. The glow worms and bioluminescence, colored sand beaches, glass beaches, structures like the Eiffel Tower, the Trevi Fountain. But my absolute favorite thing is the locals. Talking to locals, breaking bread with them, having a drink when I'm able to has given me some of the greatest memories that really are difficult to describe. When I was in Austria with my classmates, we were wandering around in the brook looking for a place to eat because we didn't want to go to the big chains like McDonald's because we wanted to eat food that was local and food that was specific to the area. We were invited into this small restaurant by the staff and it was completely empty and they sat us near the bar and they sat with us and they chatted with us and they talked to us about the town and their hometowns and what it was like there growing up and working there and they asked us about Montreal, they asked us about Canada, about what it was like to travel to Europe and it was really a special, it was a really special experience. Another time was when I was in both Australia and New Zealand, I would call back home on video chat and I would talk to my friends and family in French and anytime I would hang up I would get Aussies and Kiwis coming up to me and chatting to me and you know, asking me about Montreal and asking me about Canada because they, as soon as they heard French, they knew I had to be from the French part of Canada, of course. Those are just a couple of the experiences I've had with local people while I've been traveling that are really special and are hard to replace, that are hard to, to get in any other way. Some of the best things aren't things you can do. They're what you can experience when you're away from your routine. So that is, all I have for today. Thank you again so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them down in the comment section below. And you can connect with me across my social media as at Autumn Afar on everything. And remember to do something today that your future self will thank you for. I'll see you next time.